Hello, everyone, and welcome to my very first YouTube Live. Um, so we have changed from Facebook Live to YouTube Live. So those of you who are live, welcome. And if you're watching the recording, welcome. I am Shannon Riley Coiner. I am the founder um, of Truly Force Free Animal Training. So um, in every month, we do a 30-minute Ask the Trainer. So many of the questions that you're going to hear today are questions that people have um, submitted throughout the month. So you're welcome to submit questions and send them to us, and, and then I can talk about them on the live. And you're always welcome to obviously see the um, recordings and watch it. And if you like this video, please share it and like it as well. So... Once again, I'm Shannon Riley Coiner. Welcome to Truly Force Free Animal Training's uh, Ask the Trainer YouTube Live. Um, and uh, I just want to start off with a couple announcements. You can um, always check out, if you haven't ever been on the website of Truly Force Free Animal Training, go to trulyforcefree.com and check us out. If you have any questions, you can always email us at info at trulyforcefree.com and we'll get back to you. And we are on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. Uh, so you can check us out there. If you are looking for a book for yourself or a friend about dog training and kind of how dog training transitioned from traditional training to what we do now for positive training, you can check out my book, The Evolution of Dog Training. It talks about how dog training started 100 years ago or, or well, it was before that, but we kind of started 100 years ago and where it's uh, progressed to where it is today. So um, you can always check out that book. Um, on Amazon, it's available and it's available on audio, ebook, as well as in paperback. So lots of options for you. And if you check out trulyforcefree.com, there's lots of free videos. So there's free blogs, and then there's also classes and courses and webinars that you can purchase. And if you're interested in checking it out and want to try it out for free, you have the opportunity this month to win a hundred dollar gift card. Um, so we have on all the social media platforms, two things going on. So one is if you check out, I was interviewed by Bloom. Um, it's a Florida um, TV station. And um, so if you check out that interview and you listen to it or you watch it and then you answer some of our questions, you could be entered to win a hundred dollar free gift card for trulyforcefree.com. You also have an opportunity by listening to a podcast that um, I did with um, and talking about choke chains and, and the neck damage that can happen with just a collar. So it's with a physical therapist, Cindy Maurer. She is a human physical therapist, a PhD in physical therapy, and then she just became a dog physical therapist. So it's a really great podcast, a really great um, conversation that we have. So if you check out either of those, go to the end and you could win a $100 gift card if you answer our few questions that we have about that. So that's enough about all the housekeeping. Let's get to these questions because I have some really great questions from you guys this month and I'm really excited and hopefully we can get through all of them um, thoroughly enough to help you out. So the first one um, is a really great question and it's um, from Lucy Grace and it says, how long did it take to train your dog? Um, I never quite know how to answer that because my dogs are lifelong learners. People also ask me about getting their dogs to pay attention. Um, we always do a lot of focus exercises in my classes. So Lucy is a, obviously a trainer. Thank you, Lucy, for your question. So that's a really good question of how long does it take to train a dog? So there's a, lots of answers for this because it's not as most things. There's not just one simple answer. So one thing is that um, depending on the skill, so harder skills are going to take longer. So like if you're just teaching sit in the house, that might be pretty quick. Maybe it only takes a couple weeks, depending on how much you repeat and consistently practice. But things like recall um, are going to be harder because they're out in the public. And so you may recall your dog because they're chasing after a rabbit. Well, that's going to be really difficult and you have to take a lot more time to train it. So um, although there's some, this has been debunked a little bit, there are some ideas that the um, it takes a, a 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. So I always kind of think about that. So if it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert pianist or an expert at anything, um, 
you need to put that, I think that mentality with dogs, that this isn't one time learning. None of us learn anything um, one time. So I use an analogy of driving a lot with training dogs, because when we first train dogs, we should be practicing in our house and really low distracting environments. Just like when we start to learn to drive, we practice in parking lots and maybe um, we just sit in the driveway and think about what we're going to do. We don't even actually drive, but we don't go to a super busy freeway the very first time we drive. That would not be a success for us or anyone else on the road. So I always try to tell people like everything takes time. Everything takes practice. So during COVID, I tried to learn how to knit or crochet. I was determined. I have so many kits that are unfinished because I picked too hard of kits. So it wasn't easy for me. I didn't have anybody teaching me. I didn't go slow enough and I got frustrated. So I just gave it up. So when you are working with your dog, you want to make them really small, simple steps. So they keep having success. So for me personally, um, I don't really actively captain is, um, 13 and scout is, um, eight or nine. I can't remember right now. And so both of them, we don't actively like teach anymore all the time. And captain's deaf now. So he just recently became, um, deaf. He has had chronic ear infections in one ear and the other ear is he's deaf. So, um, thank goodness that I taught him hand signals, but I have had to reteach captain at 13 how to do things differently because he doesn't hear me anymore. So he is still learning at 13. So one example is um, when he's in my backyard, normally I would call him and say, Captain, come and he'd come running in. Well, he might be outside. And if it's nighttime, um, I don't want to talk really loud. Or one way he responds is if I clap really loud, he seems to be able to hear that. Or if I whistle really loud, he can hear that. So he hears some of those tones. But if it's nine o'clock at night, I don't want to be making those noises and disrupting my neighbors. So what I taught him is if I flash my porch light when it's dark, it means come in and because he can still see it. So he at first had, I had never done that with him before. Um, and I started flashing the lights and then he would look up at me because he noticed the light flash. And then I gave him the hand signal. I kind of waved him in. Now I don't I don't use the hand signal anymore. I just flash my lights and he comes running in if I need him to come in. So he's still learning um, with Scout. She's a little younger and, um, you know, there are still things I teach her, but it, um, but they've kind of all learned their life lessons. But if we do things like go somewhere new, Scout doesn't, after COVID, Scout got used to be scared of the vet. And then during COVID, she got scared of the vet again. So I am reteaching her not to be scared of the vet. So when we go to the vet, she gets lots of goodies. We do some vet visits sometimes. Um, because she got really scared when she got taken away from me in the parking lot to get her vaccines. So learning, I think, I guess my short answer for that is learning is always happening. Um, it depends on the skill that you're teaching and it depends on the difficulty of the skill. So, um, sit in your house might get mastered really easily, but sit at the beach, um, might be challenging if you haven't practiced it. Um, recall, might be really easy um, in the house, but it might be difficult at the park. Um, loose leash walking might be really easy in your neighborhood where they know all the smells, but you go camping with them and loose leash walking might be really difficult. Um, I teach agility, as many of you may know. And um, those dogs are always learning. I mean, some of those dogs have been doing agility with me for 10 to 12 years and they still learn skills. I still give them lessons. They, we new, do new things a lot. Some things are repeated. Um, sometimes their learning has to change because, um, you know, being deaf or as they get older, maybe they can't jump as high. So we have to change things a little bit. We make adjustments to where those dogs are at. So there's no really straight and arrow. I fully like, I agree with you, Lucy, that um, my dogs are lifelong learners and, um, when we're in different experiences, sometimes we have to adjust. My philosophy is that I teach my dogs a lot of foundation behaviors and words because they don't know English as their first language. So I teach them sit, come, down, stay, leave it, drop it. Um, out means, you know, go away from me. Um, there's a lot of little things I teach them. So in new environments, if they've mastered those words, when we're in new environments, those words aren't new to them they may hesitate to respond because they're have to process. But, um, 
then we have a way of communicating. So making those really solid, I think, helps. So hopefully that helps you. Um, it's kind of a circle talk feels like, but it um, it isn't a straightforward answer. But I believe that dogs are lifelong learners. And um, my dogs still get treats for sit sometimes and, you know, recall. And even though they know those things fairly well in the house. So I um, hope that helps a little bit. Um, this one's a really good question from Debbie. Um, she asked it on Facebook and, um, she's, she is very cute. She says, thanks for being you. Um, what would you suggest for a Yorkie who barks constantly when his mom gets on the phone for business and she can't get him to stop? Oh, this has become such a problem with, um, COVID. A lot of people work transitioned from working, and an office to home. So they had to learn how to deal with these dogs that, um, that are always in your business. And I have a client um, who I worked with who, um, her dog barked every single time she got on zoom. And so we had to work through this. So I actually have some clients that have had this I've worked with personally. So one of the things that I suggest is anytime a behavior is predictable. So, you know, you're going to get on this call for business, you know, you're going to get on a Zoom call. You know you're going to get on your computer to work. I have another client who's working on that. Every time she gets on her computer, her dog's bugging her. Um, you know that it's very likely they're going to do bark when you get on this phone call. Then before you get on the phone call, give them something they really, really like. Like um, stuffed Kongs are great So because you, you can stuff them with whatever. So if they have food sensitivities, you can stuff them with whatever their food sensitivity, you know, the food they can have is. Um, Otherwise you can put peanut butter or cream cheese or cheese whiz and, you know, you can put kibble in it. You can freeze it. Um, There are so many options with Kongs. Um, Another option is you give them, you know, a bone, a bully stick. You give them something that they really, really love to keep them occupied. You could do snuffle mats. You could do licky mats. Um, If, you are working somewhere where they like to be in the backyard. You can toss treats all over the backyard so they can be searching for them. The idea is that you give them something to do when you know their behavior is going to be triggered. Um, my example is I have three kids, as some of you may know, and they're all teenagers now. But when they were young and we would go to church or we would go somewhere, they had to be quiet, like a restaurant. I had this bag in my car that was quiet toys that only came out when we were at church or only came out when we were at um at a restaurant. And so they had these toys or these little quiet snacks or I prepared because I knew there was a very decent chance that my um, kids were going to get squirmy in church or at this restaurant. So I had toys ready for them or snacks ready for them that um, so that I could prevent the unwanted behavior, but then teach them how to sit there nice and quiet. So if you give your dog a Kong while you're right before you get on a business call and they're totally focused on that, um, then they learn how to just lay next to you without, um, getting in your business. A story that some of you may know, because if you've heard me at all, um, talk about Scout when she was a puppy. So Scout's my Jack Russell mix and she is, um, was a little brat (laughs) as a puppy. And I would be, um, she would be in the bathroom with me when I was getting dressed. So I would be brushing my hair, brushing my teeth. And I fed her in the bathroom because I had two labs that I didn't want them to eat her puppy food. So she would be in there, but she would scarf up her food out of the bowl. And like, I'm brushing my teeth and she'd bite, jump up and bite me in the rear end. And she would do it constantly. And I would turn around and I'm like, ouch, stop. So I quickly realized that this was a pattern with her. Once she finished her food, she was bored. She wanted to play. So instead of feeding her out of the bowl, I got a kibble nibble ball, which is just a circle um, little ball that you can put kibble in. So if you Google kibble nibble ball, you can look. If you look at Truly Force Free, um, we have it in our Chewy, you know, recommended toys. So I would give her her kibble in the kibble nibble ball. You could use a Kong wobbler. You could use anything. But she rolled that around for 10 or 15 minutes while she was getting her kibble out. So she was playing. She was occupied. And um, she was using, you know, her brain some. And then she would just lay down on the bath mat while I finished getting ready. And we completely stopped the biting um, right away. And then she's never done it since. But she was getting, a, because I was turning around saying, ow, and no, that was reinforcing for her. And it was not reinforcing for me. So we had to change it. So I did it ahead of time. I 
pre-planned to prevent the behavior I didn't want. So with um, this little Yorkie who's barking, um, probably it's being reinforced accidentally by saying, no, quiet, stop it. And the Yorkie's getting attention. So instead of doing that, flip it and give the Yorkie something before all of that happens. And then, um, then when you, when you're on your business call, they'll be occupied. Now, depending how fast they go through the Kong and their experience with the Kong, you may have to have multiple toys there that you can keep giving them, but hopefully this starts to create a new trend. Um, if worst case you had to, you could always put them your, um, the Yorkie in like a, if they're crate trained in a crate or a bedroom, if you needed it, if they, you know, needed a little distance from you because it was too triggering for you to be on the, um, phone or on the phone at the time. So, um, you know, it's just trying to help them make better choices. So, um, I hope that that kind of helps because that can be used for a lot of behaviors. Um, I have one client that, um, when they start cooking the dog, you know, bugs them and starts barking because they want whatever they're cooking. So I said, okay, feed them their food toy outside in the food. You know, and then they're eating their kibble while they're doing something else. You can be doing what you need to do. So, um, you know, dog training, I always say is simple, but it's not easy. So I can tell you these um, suggestions that are fairly simple suggestions, but sometimes the follow through takes a little more effort on our part as humans. So let me see what the next question is. Um, so here is a question from Kelly, um, and it's another Facebook submission. And it says, um, where do you, where do we view the recall? It seems like no one can let one loose because uh, they don't come back. So I think what she's saying in this question is, you know, what, how, how do we look at, at recall? Like, is it, is it realistic to expect that a dog's always going to come back no matter what? And how do we view that? And um, whenever I'm dealing with recall, there's a few things. So we have to make it positive. We have to make them want to come to us and we have to practice a lot. This is a behavior that needs to become a reflex before you can really trust them to be out. There's also a little caveat that there are some dogs that are just so adventurous that recall is harder for them. And those dogs sometimes won't get the um, freedom of being free, free, where they might run away. And so um, this sometimes happens. This happened with a lab that I had um, rescued that I was fostering. And she had lived in a um, dog run, small dog run for most of her life. And I think I fostered her when she was between three and four years old. And um, so she came to me and her life experience had been, you're in a dog run 24 seven, they come and feed you. And every once in a while, the owners would let her out and they lived on a couple acres um, that were fenced by an electric fence and she would run around, but then they would put her back in the pen. And so she actually recall was a very aversive thing. It was negative because she knew she was going back into this dog run and no one was going to pay attention to her for till the next meal time. So it was really sad. Um, so for that dog, <laughs> I um, would take her. And once I did a lot of training with her, um, sometimes we would go to a lake where it was safe. Like there was a ravine, it was a, a cove where she couldn't really go anywhere. So I started letting her off leash and, and she couldn't go anywhere. So she had that freedom, but it was contained. Um, Scout, my current Jack Russell has a really good recall, except when birds are around. And it's not that she will chase a bird, but what happens is she sticks her nose on the ground and starts following where, especially shore birds, if we're at a, a lake or a beach, so what I've had to do with Scout, she can be off leash in a lot of scenarios, except if there's potentially shorebirds or birds around, particularly shorebirds, because she doesn't really care about ones that are flying. It's if they're on the ground. So what I have done with her, if we're somewhere I want her to be off leash, is I tie her to usually captain's leash and her leash. And if I have another dog, so she's got a long line, essentially somewhere between 10 and 15 feet. And then sometimes I tie that log, that line to a log or a rock that she has to pull around. So she gets some freedom, but she can't get away from me completely because she's got to pull this log. Um, it makes her get a little exercise, but she can play in the water. She, so she's somewhat free, but not fully free. 
So that's how I have to deal with scout in um, a lake situation or a place like a beach. For a captain, on the other hand, he has always, now that he's deaf, I wouldn't be able to do this as much um, because he can't hear me. Um, but his recall when he was at his prime was the best recall I've ever had for a dog. But we started, he was born at my house because his mom was a rescue. So I had all the pups and then I kept him. He started working on recall, I believe, around five weeks old. So we started giving him little treats when he started eating some solid food for coming to me. Um, and then we practiced it all the time. First, we mastered it in the house and then we mastered it in the backyard. And then I would take him to parks on a long leash, 10 or 15 foot leash and practice um, different games with him. Um, I would take him to tennis courts where he could be off leash, and but he was fenced. And then when we would go places like a lake or the beach and he'd be swimming, he'd come back and he got lots of treats and always high value treats. So hot dogs, um, cheese, cream cheese. I use um, Red Barn food log that he loved. So always good stuff, like good, good stuff. He also was my agility partner before he retired. So we worked a lot together. We had a really tight relationship. And I always like to share this story about him because it was the time when I recognized all my work had been for good. So we were at a lake and he was down in a ravine going to the bathroom and I was standing up at the top waiting for him. And all of a sudden I saw him go in a point. Um, he, I'd never seen him go into a point before. So that cued me that something was going on down there. So I said, you know, his name, Captain, and I always teach all my dogs to um, focus on me when I say their name. So when I teach and I do this in my puppy classes, I say their name. They look at me. I call it the name game. They look at me. So I had always taught that. So when I said Captain, it was a reflex for him to just look up at me. He looks up and I said, leave it, which we had also practiced solidly um, throughout his life. And then I said, come. So I'd given him some instruction. First, look at me then don't engage in whatever you're engaging with and then come up the ravine, come back to me. So he came running up the ravine and a huge buck went running the other direction. And when he came to me, obviously we had the biggest party that you could ever have with a dog um, for a recall. And um, that's when I was, could really see the work that I had done worked in real life and it was successful. So, um, when you are working with recall, I think some of it depends on personality. There are some dogs that are just really independent, like Scout, and she just loves birds. I mean, shorebirds that she can put her nose down and do that nose work with, she just loves. And um, so I go, okay, well, let me see where I can compromise with this. Um, Captain loves Oh, being obedient. I mean, that is like his, he's just one of those dogs. And um, so he will come to me um, right away. But you have also dogs that are in between. And my first Jack Russell Buster was not nearly as good. We had to practice a lot, a lot, a lot. And then once we became agility partners, um, we bonded even tighter. So then he wanted to come to me. So recall is something that needs lots of practice in lots of different environments, not just the same old boring environment. They need to be set up for success. So if you think they're going to run off, if you go to a park, keep them on a long line so that they don't run off away from you where they get away. You need to use really, really good treats. Um, sometimes I tell my clients, have a treat that's just for recall. So a recent client um, that was struggling, I said, okay, I want you to get turkey bacon, cook it, really crispy, break it into tiny little pieces. And every single time that dog comes to you, they get a piece of turkey bacon. And that helped reinforce that behavior of coming back. And um, so practice and don't do anything your dog perceives as negative after. So that dog I fostered assumed that when she, you said, come, she was going to go into this, um, back into this dog run and get ignored. So of course she didn't want to come. Another one of my clients had a great recall with their dog and then they would go to the beach and the only time they said come was when it was time to put the leash on and go home. That dog learned that come means it's time. All the fun is over. It's time to go home. And that dog stopped coming. And actually, when they came back to me as a private, they said, Shannon, I don't know what's going on. Um, I said, come to that dog. And she literally ran the other direction in my yard. So we had to change the word and retrain come. And then I told them, if you're at the park, you say, come, or their new word was here, here, treat her and then let her go back and play. Come, treat her and let her go back and play. So she doesn't figure out the pattern that come means it's time to go home. 
some clients that give their dog a bath. If they say come and then they put them in the bathtub, they have put those two things together really quickly and then they won't come to you to go into the bathtub. So um, you have to really think about what's happening. And I, you know, if any of you have followed me, you know that I like to put things in human perspective. So um, if I have a person who I make plans with and they keep canceling at the last minute, I'm going to stop making plans with that person. Doesn't mean that I'm mad at that person. It's just that I'm getting tired of having that same pattern happen. If I have someone that every time I get together with them, they're really negative, I may not want to be spend time with that person anymore. So when we're working with our dogs, we have to meet, get their needs met and we have to be someone they want to be around. So if we're always yelling at them, if we're always correcting them, if they're always punishing them, why would they want to come to us? Uh, that's where traditional training, where we use choke chains and pinch collars and shock collars to tell their dog what's wrong. 99% of the time, our timing is off in those situations. So we just confuse the dog and frustrate them and maybe scare them, maybe create anxiety or stress. And if they pair it with spending time with us, then they're not going to want to come to us. But if they spend time with us where we give them scratches and we play ball with them and we give them treats, they're more likely to want to spend time with us because we're cool to spend time with. So um, that's something that like with my dogs, um, every day, you know, we have lots of interactions. So, you know, we have our nighttime snuggle time. We have our morning routines. Um, Captain doesn't really do a lot of exercise anymore, you know, just minimal, but we used to go on hikes or we used to do different things. So um, we created a relationship just like you would create a relationship with a human. So um, we're almost out of time. Um, I hope that those questions all, you know, kind of helped you see um, in general. So we talked about a lot of things. We talked about um, how long it takes to train a dog. We talked about how to prevent a behavior we don't want um, and how to change it into something we, we like better. And also talking about building that relationship. And, and I guess that's a huge thing. If any of you have also followed me, you know that I think if I, whenever I'm asked, what's one thing that someone should know about training a dog is you have to have empathy and compassion for those dogs. And you have to have empathy and compassion for yourself because you're both learners. You're learning how to train your dog if you've never done it before, or it's a different dog. Your dog is learning. So you have to be able to work together and not get frustrated. Sometimes I get frustrated with myself, even if I'm trying to train something that I don't even, um, that I'm learning. I mean, I want to learn how to do dancing with your dogs. I want to learn how to do freestyle. I am not a very good dancer. I am not, I love music, but I'm, and I, and I'm a good trainer, but I don't know how to put all that together. So when I start learning that I have to have some compassion for myself and for my dog, because I'm learning and he's learning at the same time. So that's the same thing with my agility students. I always tell them you're learning and they're learning. So let's just all, you know, be kind to each other and not judge each other or um, criticize each other, even internally criticize ourselves because it's just how life is. So um, I hope that you all enjoyed today's um, uh, YouTube live and Please, 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 if you have questions, if um, please submit them to us. You can submit them on Facebook, on Instagram. You can submit them on um, info at trulyforcefree.com. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it uh, because I just want to help. My goal with Truly Force Free Animal Training was to help be able to help anyone, anywhere, be able to use positive force-free methods for their dogs, their cats, their horses. And um, so we're always in putting on new material. There's the face. We're always adding new webinars and classes. Um, so check it out. If you like that, share it with your friends, because we just want to make this a happy place for us and our animals. So I hope you enjoy that. Check out the evolution of dog training and I will see you guys next month.